Okay, welcome to the vinyl ripping session. Um, it's not Cinco de Mayo, but I uh, thought it would inject a little festivities there. Um, what we're going to do today is, uh, just to give you an overview, is I'm going to cover the basics of the notion of transferring vinyl to high resolution digital files. And um, I'm going to demonstrate the use of the necessary gear in a step-by-step -step process where we're going to start from scratch and hook it up each little piece of the gear and you'll, you'll see how easy it is to go together. If you've done any uh, vinyl transfers to cassettes in the past, uh, this is actually an easier process. You know, once you acclimate yourself to it, you'll see that it's, it's quite easier than the, the old cassette uh, method. So what I'm going to do first is uh, I'm going to disconnect the audio part. And so I'll just basically tell you what you need to start out. You need the computer, of course, and uh, I'm using this Mac Mini here. And that's a very popular type of computer for this um, task. I'm going to be using some software that runs on the Mac platform, but uh, most of the introductory part of the seminar could equally apply to a Windows platform. Until later on, we're going to focus on some feature-specific things that I think are um, found in this software that are useful and make this process easier. So you need the computer and you need an analog to digital converter. If you're familiar with computer audio playback, you know you need a DAC or digital to analog converter to convert the digital to analog so you can hear it in your system. This is the opposite process where you go from analog to digital or ADC. And I've got an example of that here. There are tons of these things out on the market now. I like this one because I like to put it in my carry-on bag, and it's a small, nice small device. This is made by this company called RME. Uh, it's a German company. They're big in the pro audio world. This is called the Babyface, and it goes up to 192 kilohertz, 24-bit. I'll talk a little bit about file formats and sample rates uh, later on, by the way. Um, so this connects via USB, and the USB connection uh, similar to what you find in a lot of DACs these days. Uh, one wire supplies power as well as data transfer in this case. And it's also bi-directional, so you get data flow from this device to the computer and from the computer to this device. Um, now this has a D connector on here. Many of these devices that come in a larger chassis will have other connectors, more familiar type of connectors. RCA connectors are rare. You'll see pro audio type connectors like XLR or TRS, the quarter inch phone connectors. Those are more common in this market segment, but adapting those to audiophile uh, RCA type connectors is not a big deal at all. This particular unit comes with this little breakout cable, which I'll connect here. And that's just to interface the D connector, which is just made to make this thing a nice small form factor interface that with this output harness which has the audio connectors on it. And I'll plug that into the computer. Okay. Um, one other connection that you need is from the turntable to this device. And let me find the connections here. Okay. So we start with this turntable and by the way, um, uh, thanks to uh, Roy Hall and Leland Leard of Music Hall for loaning this turntable. I'm using this Music Hall MMF2. I can check it as luggage in a, in a case here, so it makes it easy to transport around. Um, here's your RCA connectors. And on this breakout cable and on many types of audio interfaces, these devices generally go by the moniker of audio interface. That's something that has an analog to digital and digital to analog converter. It interfaces your computer with the outside world of audio. It has XLR connectors on it. And so <clears throat> you just use these adapters, RCA to XLR, and connect those to the, to the XLR inputs. Now there's one thing that, a question that comes up quite often. A lot of these audio interfaces will have what are called combo connectors. And they look sort of like XLR jacks, 
but not really. They have an extra hole in the middle, and these type of connectors actually, uh, let's see if I have a picture here. <coughs> they actually accept two different types of connectors. They accept XLRs, and they accept the TRS or, or phone plugs. Those connect internally to different uh, circuits inside the unit, and I'll, I'll get into that in terms of what, what you need in terms of the type of cartridge you have and interfacing it. Okay, <laughs> so just step back a little bit. Uh, everybody's seen ads for these USB turntables, you know, rip your vinyl, get it onto your iPod, things like that. Um, these USB turntables are not sort of the, the type of uh, gear that you want to use if you're interested in the highest quality transfers. Uh, the USB turntables are typically limited to uh, 16 bits, uh, 44.1 kilohertz, 48 kilohertz, CD quality. We're interested in a higher quality transfers, so we're going to be using 24-bit um, word length and up to 192 kilohertz sample rate. We want to capture as much of the information in the grooves as possible, and to use a USB turntable with 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit is too limiting for what we want to accomplish and I'll explain a little bit about that more. Uh, one of the other motivations here is probably 90% of or more of the music that's been released on vinyl formats is unlikely to ever see re-release in a digital format. So if you want to hear this music, you really have to go to vinyl. Uh, go to Gem, look it up on Gem or Discogs. Go to yard sales, garage sales thrift stores, uh, amazing what you can find. So what we want to do in this process is to make the transfer of the vinyl indistinguishable, the digital transfer indistinguishable from the original vinyl playback. All right, so I've deliberately chosen this type of turntable to show you that you don't need top shelf gear to really extract a lot of information from the vinyl in terms of uh, frequency response. So, um, talk a little bit about a couple parameters that we're addressing and, and I'm throwing around here, such as sample rate. Uh, sample rate, you know, CD quality is uh, 44.1 kilohertz. It's the number of times that the audio uh, signal is sampled per second. Um, I'm going to show you the rationale for using higher sample rates. If you go on some of the internet forums, um, some of the armchair, armchair um, vinyl needle drop people will say, well, why, why do you want to use a higher sample rate than 44.1 kilohertz? Because after all, you know, you can't hear higher than 20 kilohertz, which is true. But when you increase the bandwidth of the capture, you also increase the linearity of the capture for signals that are below the audio, your audible frequency response threshold. So, and in addition to that, you do capture more of the information on the recording. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to uh, start the software and put it in a playthrough mode where we can hear the audio coming from the turntable. And then I'm also going to uh, OK, the cue isn't working. Uh, well, that's what happens when you check it as luggage. <laughs> uh, OK, so we're going to fire up a spectrum analyzer. Also amplifying. Is it also yeah. A to plus amp? That's correct. Yeah, and and I'll explain a little bit about that. But basically, uh, these devices typically they're intended for the semi-pro or home audio recording market. So they include preamplifiers that will boost. <laughs> I was using this to measure the room actually, and I didn't change it. All right. Uh, to boost the signal from the um, turntable up to line level, which is where these, these devices were. Okay, so you go from microvolt or millivolt level signals up to hundreds of millivolts or volt, sort of volt level signals. Those are typically included in these devices, so you don't have to buy anything extra. When you get into the more high-end uh, pro audio interfaces, those are line level and you have to supply some external preamplification. And I'm talking about connecting your turntable directly to this device, and I'll explain the rationale for doing that as well. Okay, so this is a spectrum analyzer, and 
I see we're picking up some noise here. Okay, you know, there's, there's some pickup of, of some noise here, and I don't know quite what's going on. I've never seen this happen before, but it won't really affect the, the demo. Um, it could be the demos, yeah. Okay, so anyways, uh, what we got here uh, is a spectrum analyzer where we're plotting the frequency response as a function of time, and we're using this artificial color display to show um, the frequency content. And this is this garbage I was talking about, this noise up here. I don't know where this is coming from. There's some, some noise pickup from somewhere. Maybe it's this microphone? No. Wireless mic. And so what I'm going to do is, is start the playback. Okay, so the intensity of the color is mapped to the amplitude of the recording at that frequency. And you can see the finger snaps are generating energy out at least to about the, the Nyquist limit here, which is 96 kilohertz. So there's some information on this recording that if you were to use a lower sample rate, would be omitted. And in particular, you know, for percussion instruments, um, percussion instruments which do have some harmonic overtones that go into the ultrasonic frequency range, you would miss those if you use the lower sample rate. Now, can you hear those overtones? No. Okay. But what we're doing is we're, we want to capture faithfully the information that's on the recording, and also by using the wider bandwidth in our electronics in our digital capture, we're also improving the linearity of the whole process. And it does take up more hard disk space, but nowadays um, the size of hard disks has, has gotten to the extent that we're, it's no longer a matter of concern for these files. Okay. Um, okay, so that's one parameter in the capture process, which is sample rate. The other one is resolution, in other words, the word length. And as you probably know, CDs use 16-bit uh, word length, which corresponds to about 65,000 discrete individual levels of amplitude that can be captured per sample. We're going to be using 24 bits uh, of resolution, which increases that by a factor of 256. Uh, if you want to think of it as an analogy of uh, where you have a staircase going up to a building and then there's a, a handicap entry ramp which has a gradual slope to it. Um, the roughness of the concrete in that ramp is approximately 256 times smaller than the steps in the steps. So that's the, t the level of extra information that you're capturing there. Now, I've noticed um, it's some interesting um, information on the internet recently um, advocating that it's useless to use 24-bit word length because it has to do with the, the noise in the signal and that you're just increasing the quantization noise. You're not really actually capturing discrete levels. And that's, that's true, but um, it's also true that it's hard to find a 16-bit analog to digital converter these days that is linear to 16 bits, which is necessary for that argument to hold water. Uh, you really need to get up to at least 19, 18, 19 bits. And typically, most 24-bit converters these days are linear up to about 20, 21, 22 bits. So you really, really want to use a 24-bit converter, even considering that type of argument. 
Um, in terms of ripping the LPs, um, making this sort of project, I wouldn't want to go and make a career out of it and start ripping albums and devoting full time to that process. I like to think of it as a lazy ripping process where you just don't change your behavior at all. You just put on the LP and listen to it for pleasure, only this time you record it. And then the next time you want to hear that favorite recording, you just go and play the digital copy, which, again, I maintain the goal here is to make it indistinguishable from the original analog vinyl playback. And by doing that, you save wear and tear on your stylus. And uh, a lot of us have expensive styli that, um, you know, there's a, there's a uh, amount of play that each stylus can uh, accommodate before you have to have it replaced or retipped, what have you. So the longer you can forestall that, the better. The other thing that you need besides a computer and analog to digital converter is a place to store the audio. And um, nowadays there are many more options. Um, up in our exhibit room, which is in the, the tower here, uh, room 2003, we're using a, a NAS or network attached storage device like this, which is really the hot setup if you have a large collection and you anticipate transferring thousands of albums, uh, and, which I've done. And this is really pretty much expandable uh, for the long-term future. You can replace the mechanisms with bigger ones if you need a larger uh, storage array. It's fault tolerant so that uh, if one of the mechanisms fails, you can replace it, you can hot swap it, and you don't lose any data. The other alternative would be to use um, little firewire drives or, or USB hard drives uh, like this. But again, if you do have a large collection and you foresee doing lots of transfers, what you're going to end up with if you go this way is a box full of these things that you don't use anymore and then eventually you're going to get an ass. So you might as well get an ass right now uh, when you start on this project. These boxes go for about um, 800 bucks or so uh, without the mechanisms, and then you can fill them for about another uh, five, six hundred dollars. So for about twelve hundred dollars, you, you get 12 terabytes, which is which is really inc an incredible value. Um, someone raising their hand back there. Yeah. Is this network attached storage a RAID one? Uh, yeah, um, it can be RAID one. Uh, I use RAID six, which means that you have two. Uh, fault tolerant mechanisms so that two of them can break before you lose any data. Um, these things are not, these are pretty bulletproof. Uh, the array that we're using here actually um, it's gone through a lot and uh, one time it was dropped from waist height onto concrete on the corner. It dented the array, two of the mechanisms popped out, uh, just put them back in, just fired up like nothing happened. So these things are, are really pretty robust. Um, they're not, however, the, the RAID systems where you have redundant uh, storage, that's not the same as a backup. You do need to maintain a separate, physically separate backup of your data because these things can fail too. It's just less likely to fail than a single hard drive, but you still need a separate backup. And the other thing that you generally need when you get a RAID array is a UPS, un uninterruptible power supply, because these things can uh, fail if the power is cut at exactly the wrong time and it can corrupt the drive and you lose your data. So that's sort of one of the hidden costs here, but you can get a UPS that will work with one of these for a couple of hundred dollars and then you never have to worry about the array failing because of a, a line uh, utility power uh, loss. Um, so generally external storage, you don't want to store things on the, on the system drive. It's uh, not good policy to store large data files on the uh, system drive of the computer. And file formats. Um, you can use a flat PCM format like AIFF or uh, WAVE. WAVE is less flexible. Uh, or you can use a loss less compressed format like Apple lossless. Uh, it's exact, ex the data is stored exactly the same. In, in other words, it's bit perfect as well as the uh, flat PCM files. I prefer to use Apple lossless because it saves about 30% disk storage space 
for free. And I suspect there will eventually come a day when the array fills up and I need to get new mechanisms. If I use a lossless compressed format, it'll put that eventuality off further into the future, which I think is a good thing. Okay. So the, these are kind of general uh, thoughts that would apply to the Mac and the PC platform. And at this point, I'm going to start talking about uh, the ripping process. And what I'm going to do is use some software that my company makes uh, called Pure Vinyl. Uh, it's been designed from the ground up for this purpose. Uh, the development on this product started about 2002, 2003 and we released version 1 in 2006. We're on version 4 right now, and there, of course, been a lot of improvements along the way. Um, it's it's Mac-only uh, platform, yeah. And it, it retails for $299. Um, okay, so the process here is that you would click here and enter in the uh, metadata, the uh, album name and artist name, and so what I'm going to do is uh, start a rip of a vinyl. And once that process is underway, we can field some questions. And, um, and then continue with that process. Okay, so I'll put in the artist. And this is on Rico Disc. Okay. Uh, one of the features in the software is, as I, as I indicated before, this is really an easier process than the days of uh, cassette transfers of vinyl. With cassette, remember, there's one hand on the stylus and one hand on the record button, and you have to coordinate those because you don't want to catch the noise of the stylus hitting the record, and you don't want to miss any of the music. The software does that for you automatically. There's a trigger level setting here, and what you do is you set that just a little bit above the background level of the, of the uh, electronic noise. And so I set that here. You can press the auto button. That'll get you in the ballpark. And then what happens is once the audio crosses that threshold for a meaningful period of time, the recording process begins. So I put in the information. Now I hit record. Oh, by the way, here's, here's where you select the file formats. And I've got it set for Apple lossless 24-bit. There's a 32-bit resolution here, which is just a floating point format. It's more for testing purposes. It doesn't buy you any extra sound quality, just a larger file size. But that's more for testing. So we set 24-bit and hit record. And now it's going to wait for the music to start. I'm going to turn up the volume a little bit here. Okay, and you see now it says uh, it's recording, and what it's going to do is continue recording until we've recorded the entire side, and I lift the stylus. When I lift the stylus, it'll go into pause mode, and then it'll be paused until you actually go back and intervene and say, I'm ready to record again. Uh, I wanted to say one more thing about these types of connectors. We've used an XLR type of connector here, and that generally interfaces with these units to a microphone preamplifier, which is a low impedance input preamplifier. This is acceptable for use with low output moving coil cartridges, which are also low impedance outputs. They're, they're kind of like moving coil microphones. 
If you have a moving magnet cartridge, that's a high impedance source, high impedance um, signal source, higher voltage, and most of these devices also have instrument inputs, which are high impedance inputs, and they're suitable for the 47,000 ohm loading for a moving magnet cartridge. These combo connectors, again, you'll, you'll be able to input a, a quarter inch uh, phone plug, and that tells the device that you're using the high impedance or instrument input for moving magnet cartridges. Yes? Do you, uh, what do you do for album art? Um, in this case, there are two, two things that you do with this recording eventually. Number one is that you can just take this recording and play it using this interface, and I'll show you that as an LP. Okay, so there's really no provision for album artwork in that case. But what you can do in a separate step, which is a feature of the software, is you can render it into individual tracks that you would import, say, into iTunes, and then you can add the album, album artwork at that point. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Can you go over what the settings were for that uh, ABC converter? Yes. Because they were on there, but then we didn't go over them. Okay. So that I know how you hook, actually get the, that part to work. Okay. Um, it's, it's really, uh, it's just pretty much plug and play and then it works. Um, this particular ADC, and, and this is common, they come with control panels. Yeah, and so there are some settings here, and this is like a pro audio mixer, but fortunately you only have to look at this once when you're setting these up. Some of them have knobs, physical knobs on the devices. This one doesn't because it's small and they want to keep a small form factor, so they have virtual controls in the software. And the two controls that you're interested in here are the gain, and I've already preset this for 51 decibels, okay? So using the microphone preamps, you can set this, this gain here on this device from about zero to about 70 decibels, okay? 50 has turned out to be optimum. The way you set the signal levels is that you play a recording that has a pretty good modulation, a, a nice modern recording that, that does have some loud music on it, some, some heavily modulated grooves. And you watch the signal levels in the meters, and at the same time, you, while playing a loud section in the, in the recording, you adjust the gain until you get these peaks coming up to about minus 10, minus 9 or so. And you can see we've, we have an indicator here of the peak level. So far, it's about minus 8.5 is the below digital full scale. Now, um, this is one place where we depart a little bit from the days of cassette transfers and the, and the like. Uh, of course, most of you probably know that when you're making digital recordings, you can't go over zero dB uh, digital full scale. On cassette or analog tape, you certainly can. You can, you can oversaturate the tape. And to some extent, this improves the signal to noise ratio at the expense of a little bit more distortion in the recording. You don't have that luxury in the digital domain. Once you hit zero dB, if the signal level clips, you're going to get tremendous amounts of distortion. So that's something you want to avoid at all costs. Now, something that I didn't mention here is that, and probably you're thinking, well, he's connected the turntable right to this device. So this device must have some kind of a phono preamplifier in there because it has to do the RIAA correction curve. Um, well, we're actually doing that in software. And if you don't know what I mean by the RIAA curve, this comes about in the manufacturing process of albums, of, of LPs. And it's a special equalization curve that allows the engineers to squeeze more music onto the disc. And this has always been used since the dawn of flat platter discs, uh, uh, shellacs, or vinyl LPs. And so it looks like this. Um, rather than dump the audio onto the lacquer flat, uh, we apply this RIAA emphasis, which cuts the bass frequencies, and it boosts the treble. Um, this allows you to squeeze the grooves tighter together on the LP, because the low frequency modulations are where the stylus is really doing a lot of excursion laterally. Uh, and the treble is boosted because this lets you pre-emphasize the treble so that when you play it back and you apply the inverse of this curve, 
it reduces the, the noise that's generated from the physical process of playing the disc, um, the physical um, surface noise. So we just apply the inverse of this curve, and you see I just flipped this graph over, which is really a, a valid way to, to indicate that we boost the bass on playback and cut the treble on uh, playback as well. What this does in terms of your digital recording is that when you apply this RAA curve in the digital domain, it actually improves the headroom, increases the headroom by about 12 dB or two bits, up to two bits. Think of Super Audio CD. You start with one bit at 2.8 megahertz and most of the Super Audio CD players that were out there use a uh, low cut filter or a digital, which, which in DSP terms is called a digital reconstruction filters, filter. And what that does is it reconstructs the actual PCM digital analog waveform from that one bit bit stream. So you start with 2.8 megahertz one bit and end up with 88.2 kilohertz 24 bits. Now where does that 24 bits come from? It doesn't just appear magically. You can't start with a 2.8 megahertz one bit and get 24 bits from that. You have to trade amplitude resolution for time resolution. That's what the filter does. It removes the, the time resolution, so you go from 2.8 megahertz down to 88.2 kilohertz, but you improve the amplitude resolution. Now you've got 24 bits. Same principle with the RIAA filter, only it's not as dramatic. We only pick up a couple of bits, but that turns out to be very useful because now we don't have to be that concerned about getting the signal level up to digital full scale. We take advantage of that extra 12 dB of headroom, and as long as our peaks are up above minus 12, we recover that with the RAA filter. This is really great because now that means this process is real time instead of 0.5 real time because the only way you'd be able to get those levels to come up to zero dB and not above is to preview the recording. So you'd have to play it twice to record it once. Okay, so um, we're doing the RAA correction in the digital domain using the analog amplification of this device and then capturing that uh, analog to digital converter. Okay, um, I can field some more questions right now, yes? Uh, your first point is you had your threshold set there when you first said we're going to record. Yes. Do you have a, a little buffer uh, so that if you set the threshold in properly, you know, it records 10 seconds before the threshold hits, and then later you can actually go back and pick up exactly the start where you want it? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's an interesting way to design it, but in practice, um, it does introduce some extra complications. So it's better to really just set that trigger threshold properly, which really isn't that hard to do because this whole process is you, you hook up your A to D, play a record that has some loud modulation on it, you adjust the gain so that the peaks come up to above about minus 10. You don't have to go all the way up to zero. Then you don't have to touch it anymore. You just leave the gain set like that for every other recording that you're going to make. Recordings with quieter modulation, of course, won't come up, might not come up to above minus 12, but the dynamic range of those recordings is going to be limited anyways. So it's not really necessary to try to tweak the, the gain for every single recording. You just set it and forget it. By setting the gain, you're also setting the place where the trigger threshold needs to be set. So that's another thing that you only have to set once and then you never have to worry about that again. If the trigger threshold does drift, if your background noise does drift, that points to a problem in your hardware that needs to be corrected because that should never change, you know, as long as you don't change the game. Some so, songs start out very quiet, some ones start out with a bang. So. Well, well, but actually, see, when you set the trigger level, that's with the stylus lifted. That's just the background level, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the moment you drop the stylus, there's going to be some background noise from the vinyl that is going to push it up above that. So it will always trigger before the music starts. And same thing at the end. It won't stop recording until you actually physically lift the stylus. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, question number two. Um, does your software here uh, work to uh, help you add metadata to something that you've already recorded, for example? I've got a data 
data file there that I've recorded, you know, myself perhaps or whatever, uh -huh. and I would like to add metadata. Yes. So can I use your tool to say, I want this metadata added to this file and combine those into a, you know, officially uh, yes. metadata widget? Yes, yes, and, and there is a way to do that in, in this version 4, which um, I was going to talk about a little bit here. While you're sitting, listening to the music, and what I like to do is I, I use the world's best remote control, which is a laptop running screen sharing. This is built into the operating system, so I can walk around the house with this. I can control the whole, the whole thing right from this laptop. So I can see what's happening with the recording. I can look at the levels. Um, I can even stop the recording, but you know, again, that, that happens in an automated way. So what I do now is while I'm listening, I can type in the track names and, um, and so, of course, this is where you have to intervene manually. Um, this is not automated at this point where it, it gets the information from the internet. You, you have to type, but people type pretty well nowadays, so. So is it a planned feature to access the online? There's a bunch of metadata databases out there. Yeah, you, you can do that if you uh, actually rip the files, <coughs> rip the, uh, you take the recording and you separate it into individual tracks. But it's actually easier to do it now because there are some features that automate that process, which I'll, I'll show you. Um, Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to start with the second track. I'm not going to rip the whole album, uh, but I'm going to rip enough tracks that it will illustrate the process. So let's see, the second track on side two, uh, which is kind of apropos here, I guess, maybe. Okay, yeah, we are in Colorado. All right, so I don't have the track name, track times from the uh, recording, but if I did, then I would enter them in here. So um, I can't see them on the recording. I, what I'll do is I'll just estimate this. So we'll say it's 355 uh, and just to illustrate this. Um, Okay, and so what it'll do now is it'll display the track names as the process goes along. So if you're sitting in a remote location, um, it also tells you total to end from the total of the track list times that you typed in and the, the amount of time that's already recorded. And so you, I was just sort of guesstimating the times, but generally what you'll see if you're listening to the recording, and you should always monitor the recording while you're doing it. You should listen to what's going on here because in case there's um, you know, a dust ball on the stylus or some other malfunction with the turntable, uh, skip for instance, then you'll be able to hear that and correct it immediately rather than you know, go through this process and then find you have to re-record that album. So this tells you approximately where you are in the process and you can, you can see that it's just about at the end and so that now this is a time where if you're in a remote place you can sort of move to your listening room and get ready to lift the stylus at the end of that track. And so we got, looks like we've got about 30 more seconds. Um, some questions? Yeah. Yeah, you filled in uh, track names and times. Um, is there a place to put so-called lyrics if this was another kind of song and or can I take a picture of my album jacket cover and assign that to the same limited cover? Um, 
once, once you know, not, not in terms of this actual recording, but if you were to, you know, again, split this out into individual tracks and put them, say, into iTunes, then you could add that information, that metadata to the extent that, say, your iTunes or whatever other music player program that you're using accepts that type of information. Got a little A&K, uh, Stellan player, and it's got a little graphic that comes up with some of the things that I have purchased. Uh -huh. Okay. And put the track titles and, and times, and then have a picture of the album cover show up with my metadata file. Yeah, I mean, you can always embed the met. You know, this, this file that we're creating here is a master recording without the RAAA compensation. Then you use the render step in Pure Vinyl, which I'll show you, to create a version of the file that does have the RAAA incorporated. Um, that's where you can add the album art and that sort of thing. You were talking about monitoring, and I just wanted to ask one question. If you did have a scratch or something, you want to skip that track, uh, can you lift it up, skip that track, go to the next one, and keep playing? Correct, yeah. So basically what would happen there is you'd actually create a, a virtual another album side, and then that would, you know, as far as the software was concerned, that would be another album side, the next album side that you have to deal with. Yes. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. That's right. Yeah. 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 So if, if you do have a skip or something like that, you can lift the stylus and you can resume the recording either with the next track or you could maybe, you know, clean that, that record and remove that skip and then start, resume the recording with that same track and that would, would be considered another album side. No, no, it wouldn't. But in the, in the subsequent step, you would, you would, um, instruct the software to disregard that. Yeah, I'll show you how that works. Okay, so we'll, we'll start the second um, side. Now you'll see that I lifted the stylus and it's gone into pause mode, so it says stylus lift detected. It's paused, it's ignoring the audio, and our background noise level has dropped below the trigger level, so now click when ready to continue recording. And so it'll wait until I actually drop the stylus again. Okay, and you see now it's displaying the name of the track, which is where we started with this recording, and it's now recording. Okay. Um, just a couple of other things that are really important. Um, most of the pro audio audio interfaces incorporate an ADC and a DAC in the same box. I think this is really a critical thing to have because both the input analog to digital conversion process and the digital to analog conversion process are controlled by the same sample clock. If you have separate devices then there has to be a provision for you to link those two clocks together so that when you're listening and as I said it's very important to monitor this process audibly when you're listening, you can tell if there's anything wrong. But that's impossible unless you can synchronize these sample clocks. What'll happen is you'll get clicks and noise in the playback, out in the output, in the monitoring. It's not in the recording, it's just because your monitoring device can't synchronize with the analog to digital converter. So some separate devices will have clock ports on them, but for instance, if you have a clock output port on the ADC, then you need to have the corresponding clock input port on the DAC for them to synchronize. It's a lot easier if you just have a device that has them both in the same box. Um, I think there's, there might be a couple of companies here that produce ADCs or DACs, and there might be one or two that have this feature where you can synchronize the clocks, but that's a really critical thing to have. So. That's only during the recording process. Yeah, that's right. That's not right. when you actually want to play it out. That's right. If you only want to play those files, then you don't need an ADC. You can just use a standalone DAC, and that's fine. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. The, the quality issue, the quality of differences between one deck and another, they sound differently. 
is that true for the opposite too? I mean, uh, converting into the A little bit, a little bit, but actually, in, in terms of the signal chain, the digital to analog process is a lot more difficult to realize, you know, technically. So you will hear more differences between DACs than you will between ADCs. But the differences between ADCs are in terms of the amount of noise, the linearity of the conversion, and you, you can hear some differences, but um, they're, they're smaller than they are in the, in the DACs. Okay. You have to be careful of there if people will hype the highs to make it sound more brilliant. I mean, the cheaper ones. Will, yes. And that's the thing to stay away from. Don't go too cheap. For yeah, that's right. That's right. It, it is, that's true. And also, uh, some of the less expensive ADCs, also, because they're not as linear, will tend to distort and hype the highs a little bit more. And, and it makes it more digital and brittle sounding. Uh, that's, that's what you'll pick yeah, up. Show me what you say. This is cheap and this is okay. Yeah, sure. Um, you can actually get pretty spectacular results with some inexpensive audio interfaces like this. You don't have to spend a ton of money. Um, this one's about 700 bucks. There's another one called the TC Electronic Impact Twin, which is really popular with our users. You can buy those on Amazon for well under $300. Let's see, I think I have some pictures of them here, just to give you an idea. Okay. Um, on the top is another device that's made by the same company, RME. This is their, their Fireface. Uh, this is the TC Electronic Impact Twin. And this shows what I mean about these combo connectors. They kind of look like XLRs, but a little weird. Um, but that's because the hole in the middle accommodates the, um, the phone plug or the TRS plug. Uh, this is a Prism Orpheus. Again, it has instrument inputs on the front instead of having these combo connectors. The microphone inputs are on the back panel with XLR, standard XLRs. Uh, this is a Lynx Aurora, which is line level only. And this is um, a TC, another TC Electronic with more channels. And then this is the one we have up in our, our exhibit room, which is a Lynx Helo. Again, this is line level input only, and we have to have a separate phono stage. And we, we make some special phono stages that don't have the RAAA circuit incorporated so that you can use the RAAA compensation feature in pure vinyl. Could you just go back to that frame 30 you just had just for a second? Sure. Point out on that PC twin. Yes. Uh, so where do you go in with the moving coil? Uh, right here. Right this, this connector. There's, and that's there's two the of them? game for it? They call them combo connectors because, you see, there's the, where the XLR pins there are. There's, there's, there's one, three, and two, okay? And then in the middle, you can plug in a phone plug, and that would be the instrument input. So, Which one is it would be a moving coil, and you'd, you'd use you use an XLR connector on this exact same right. input. Okay. This is the gain. Yeah. See, this has a hardware gain control knob. No, you don't, yeah, some of these things have, have their own control panels. In this case, it's one where you don't need to, to use that. That's right, that's right, that's right, yeah. Um, Is there a performance advantage to doing the RIA, uh, RIA compensation in software? Yeah, the question is, is there a performance advantage to doing the RIAA compensation in software? And I'd say there's a tremendous advantage, and there are a lot of reasons why uh, it's, it's useful. You have perfect channel match in amplitude, and, and phase, you get a perfect match to the RAAA curve. There's no added distortion because you don't have any capacitors or resistors performing the RAAA compensation curve. Uh, and you can also do some interesting things in the digital domain, such as when you're playing back um, in pure vinyl software, as part of the high resolution signal chain, we do all of the intermediate calculations with 64 bits of precision. It's double precision floating point. At the same time, we can do things like implement a crossover for a subwoofer system, which is what we're showing up in the room. Um, and then in terms of the recording, one of the features in, in this rendering process, and now we've, we've finished the recording, so I'll say stop recording, open the pure vinyl. It creates this vinyl cue guide image, which we can use to find, uh, locate the tracks. When you take this master recording and you want to generate portable copies of it with the RAAA curve incorporated, one of the things we can do is use a special type of rumble filter to remove the low frequency noise generated by the turntable. We can use a, a zero phase shift rumble filter. 
And this is not a, an FIR type of filter, uh, which is a window type filter. This is a continuous time filter that cannot be implemented in the analog domain because you need to be able to see into the future, okay? So we can see into the future because we got the recording, we can look ahead and we can work backwards through the recording, implement what's called a symmetrical filter which has zero phase shift. It really adds impact to the bass where you, you want to remove the rumble but you don't want to impact the music. And then also pop and click removal are facilitated by doing the RIAA in the digital domain because you can remove those impulses pre, yeah, pre-filter because the filter stretches those out, making it more difficult. So here, um, it's, you see I've typed in the track names and it's already automatically assigned the track locations. So I can play those back. Uh, I think the first one I, I did cue pretty well. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip through the tracks and I'll show you that the automatic track locator works quite well. Okay, it got the intro perfectly. There's no dead air before the track. Okay, this one, it, again, I was sort of guesstimating, and it uses those track times as a basis. Uh, what I can do is if I, if I don't like the way it did that, I can delete that track, and then I can use the track locator manually and use this and then say split track and again it uses the track name I typed in and you'll see now that normally if I, if I had the correct track times it would use those as kind of a fuzzy, fuzzy logic to get into the neighborhood and then the track locator feature in pure vinyl actually does some calculations on the audio and locks into the track intro so it doesn't actually literally use that track time, but it uses it as a, a rough guide. So, okay, now I'll show you the one that I just did manually. Okay, see, and again, it's just treble um, and fairly low amplitude. And it nailed that one, which I didn't do manually. Okay, so now we flip over to the other side. We only really recorded one track here, so you'll see that it didn't, there's no bands on that side. So the next step here is that, of course, you save the track markers. Um, one of the things I'm using in the exhibit room, in fact, all the music that we're playing up there is 100% transferred from vinyl. Uh, we've got thousands of albums on our NAS drive up there. If you go out in the hallway, there's actually a poster on the wall that tells all the artists that we got on our server. So we're trying to keep things kind of interesting in terms of music selections. But what you can do at this point is you click render and now I can take these tracks and split them into physically separate files that I can copy onto my portable device or copy onto a CD. This incorporates the RIAA curve. Now I mentioned that the RIAA does give you this extra benefit of having 12 dB of headroom. That comes into play right here where we click preview output levels and what this does is it rapidly scans through the file with the RIAA curve applied and determines the peak levels and also determines the amount of makeup gain that we need to get the signal level up to zero dB full scale. Now, if you were to make this recording with a conventional phono stage with the RIAA already in the signal, by applying makeup gain, you're only adding distortion to the recording because we're only shifting levels. You're not, you can't amplify, okay? But in this case with the RIAA curve, we can legitimately add gain to the signal because we got effectively 26 bits of resolution and our output file is gonna be 24 bits. So we take advantage of that and that's really a cool thing. So actually you can see that the makeup gain it's going to apply is negative, which means it's actually gonna reduce the levels. Does that mean we clipped? No, that doesn't mean we clipped because the amount of gain in the RAA filter is arbitrary. It's determined by the frequency balance in the recording. As long as your input signal levels don't clip, the RAA curve can be adjusted within a, a large window to get your, your signal levels to the appropriate level. So then I just say um, render tracks, uh, output format, AIFF or Apple lossless. So if you wanna make CDs, you can select 16-bit. Um, here's the zero phase shift rumble filter and um, what I'm going to do is make this 24-bit Apple lossless. There's a sample rate converter so 
if you want to make CD copies, you would click that, select 44.1 kilohertz, or other multiples of the fundamental sampling frequency of 192 kilohertz. So I just say um, render tracks. And then what it does is, th this is an old Mac Mini with only two processor cores, but if you have a lot of tracks to render, it will assign one processor core to each track, making this process extremely fast. Uh, it would just, on a Mac Pro of today, this would go, it would already be finished because we'd have all our cores working on this. Yes? Uh, where is the uh, spot to add the uh, video graphic? At this stage, you said before, in the render section is where we would add the video uh, outside the uh, picture of the... Uh... What, what you would do is you take the tracks that result from this process, and then you could embed the, the artwork in that. There are plenty of third-party free utilities that you can use, if, you know, if, that's, if it's important to do that. It's not a provision in this software, but it's easy enough to do with third-party software to do the embedding of the software. You can do it with iTunes easily enough. Any plans to do a Windows version of this? Uh, is there any plans to do a Windows version? 99% uh, unlikely. Yeah. Um, the, one of the reasons is because there, there are some special graphics APIs that enable us to do this, this vinyl image a lot more easily on the Mac platform. And they, they have some really nice gateways to use the um, the graphics, the GPU, the graphics coprocessor to speed up the graphics for the metering and stuff. It's just, re it's really easy to program for that and um, not so easy on Windows. You said something about um, you would get the clicks out. Would you do that before before you do the RIAA? Or yes. Not? So right. when would we have done that? Okay, there's a, there's a, pr uh, a feature here of the pop and click removal. And what this does is it goes through the recording and looks at suspicious parts where there might be some impulse noise. And so what we do here is, for instance here, we'd, we'd check the right channel. And with some experience, you can see that this, this does look like an impulse type noise. And then we can... Um, uh, we would have done that before we hit the end of the track? It, it doesn't matter because it's, it's stored in a separate file so that if you were to render the track before, uh, you just re-render it and then it would incorporate the, the click removal. So you can really do that at any time, but yeah, preferably you want to do it before the rendering. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And that's just on the, I see, I, it shows up one of the... Yeah, so here, here's one of our pop uh, filters that we've created, which is on, on the right side here. Okay. Okay, so we go uh, editor, and then peak, and pop and click. Yeah, so this, this gives you a list. That's definitely a uh, pop impulse, because you see it's really narrow. It's one, one sample wide here. So we go on the right channel. The pop and click removal features are really basic here. Um, it's just interpolation of, you know, basically just drag a pencil across it and, and eliminate that. There are some third-party software products like Click Repair that are about 50 bucks that will work on the files generated by Pure Vinyl. And actually, those products work much better than if you were to use the RAA filter because, again, the impulses really look like impulses, impulse noise. They're sharp and they're easier to cut out than after they've gone through the RAA filter. So you would make the recording, then use that software, and then render it? That's right. That's right, that's correct. So you, you, you take the output of that software and then Pure, Pure Vinyl would take that file and you would render that. An example of that company? It's, uh, it's the, the software product is called Click Repair. Uh, the guy's in Australia. If you just use Google, look up Click Repair, um, it'll come up and it's about 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, so, in general, um, we, we have some users that, that have found that the click repair does work a lot better on these raw files without the RIAA. And then, uh, a couple weeks later, the guy will call back and say, well, it works really great, but it also kind of takes out some music, so <laughs> I'm going to live with the pops. 
Uh, it's useful if you have a recording that you can't replace and it's an antique recording or something like that and you can actually live you, you can live with the trade-offs of the noise reduction in terms of the music reduction uh, but for modern recordings I usually like to go try and find another record um, now there's another I, I've kind of when I gave the seminar a couple months ago in California I said there's another feature coming that um, will will really be a great way to do the, the click repair pop removal and uh, it's not quite ready yet but uh, it's really cool and it, it, it will solve a lot of these types of issues without removing any of the music. It's, it's just really cool. I just have to say just wait for that and, but it'll be really cool. Uh, I could give you a hint though. Um, if you have a record that you want to remove the click repair clicks from and you see another copy at a garage sale, get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Let's see if I covered everything here. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, does it seem like I missed anything? No? Okay. Yeah. Could you address how people that have a standard photo stage with a built in RIAA curve can use your software? Yeah, you would just connect it to this device. Only you would go in the line inputs instead of one of the low level inputs like the microphone or the instrument inputs. And it would make the recording the same way. That would be the same thing you could do if you wanted to say record a radio broadcast or a cassette, you wanted to make a digital copy of a cassette. You could use the software for the same thing. Uh, you just go into the preferences here and you would say, um, under vinyl correction, you would just uncheck that vinyl correction curve. And I'll show you what that looks like in terms of the interface. You can immediately tell whether or not you're applying the vinyl correction curve. When I uncheck that, the sort of platter goes away. And that means that it doesn't consider that recording to be something coming from an LP without the RIAA. It considers that to be a recording from another source that doesn't need any other additional EQ. And so you could, this is really nice if you have cassettes or something you want to copy. The trigger feature comes in handy there as well. Okay, so I guess I'll wrap it up. And uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, being such a nice audience. And um, it was a pleasure. So uh, I hope, hope you really go and do this and enjoy it. Yeah. Thanks.